You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme... A code red for humanity. The UN's climate report says human behaviour is unequivocally warming our planet. The IPCC's report says rising temperatures and changing weather patterns are to blame for extreme weather events and that nowhere is safe. But there is some room for optimism. We'll be looking at how we can fix this, starting with reducing our methane emissions. Hello and welcome to an extended daily climate news show on a day described as a code red for humanity. That's after the UN's climate change body said for the first time that it was unequivocal that humans have made the world hotter. And with it come warnings of even more intense and more frequent heat waves, an increase in heavy rainfall and more droughts. The study by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change provides governments with scientific information so they can develop their climate policies. And with less than three months until the COP26 talks in Glasgow, it said the report is a reality check for global leaders. Our climate correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, reports. As wild weather rages around the world, a landmark UN climate report has delivered a confident and frightening verdict. Human behaviour is unequivocally warming our planet, driving many of these extreme conditions. The UN says this is a code red for humanity and there is nowhere to hide. What we have found is that in every region in the world, climate and weather extremes have changed because of human influence. And um, this is particularly striking for heat waves. So heat waves have increased in their frequency and intensity around the world uh, and uh, will also continue to increase no matter, um, no matter if we stop warming at 1.5 or two or, or, or higher degrees of warming. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that many of the consequences of global warming, like rising sea levels, are already irreversible. But immediate dramatic cuts in emissions could still help us avoid the worst scenarios. That's exactly the aim of a crucial climate summit being held in Glasgow later this year called COP26, viewed by many as a last chance. When you're negotiating and you're trying to push countries to do more, how helpful is it to have this really solid science behind you? It's critical. It reduces any ambiguity. It, re it removes any wiggle room, underpinning everything in, in science and providing solidly backed um, arguments and, 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 and statements is absolutely essential in terms of narrowing the conversation to um, what needs to be done rather than debating whether we are, are, are at crisis point. Excuses are vanishing, but COP26 is still in a precarious position. Advisers directly involved in the negotiations tell Sky News that there is now a huge effort underway to resolve sticking points that threaten the summit, mainly over how to phase out coal and end fossil fuel subsidies. As host, the UK government is feeling the pressure. It's a, it's a wake-up call, and I think people should understand from this that unless we get to grips with climate change now, uh, humanity is facing catastrophe. I, I think it's as stark as that. Uh, and that's why all countries need to come forward. Uh, and that's the message that I'm gonna continue to deliver as I speak to governments around the world. The UN report could not have been clearer about what is at stake. Climate change does not respect borders, time, or the absence of global political will. The future of our planet depends on the decisions our leaders make now. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News. Well, Katerina Vitozzi joins me now. So, Katerina, break down for us then in more detail the main points of this report. Yeah, plenty to digest here, Anna. So let's look at some of that details, as you say. Well, uh, this report shows how human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2,000 years, affecting every region across the globe. You can see here the changes in global surface temperature over that time. And since 1850, there's been a dramatic rise in global temperature 
temperatures due to human and natural factors. And the IPCC report estimates uh, that that human element is responsible for around 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming from 1850 until now. That is greater than previously thought. And Every increase makes a difference and this shows what would happen to global temperatures depending on how much the climate changes. And this chart here on the left uh, is where temperatures are now and to, to the right these are where temperatures, uh, these are the temperatures we can expect with two degrees of global warming. And remember we're already more than halfway there and again every region is affected but particularly the Arctic and the Antarctic. So the big question is why greenhouse gas emissions are one of the biggest factors and every tonne of carbon dioxide that is released adds to warming as this chart shows and in terms of projections this is the best case scenario in terms of emissions these are very low levels of emissions in the future and even with them we can expect to reach 1.5 degrees celsius of warming uh, in the next 20 years and that's the legacy of global warming from the industrial period until now uh, which leaves us with irreversible changes including sea level rise up to half a meter and possibly a summer with no sea ice in the Arctic uh, within the next 30 years. Uh, you know and these are as a report full of quite bleak forecast but we can take some positivity uh, and an element of hope out of it uh, that we can still make a difference that with profound and deep cuts to emissions uh, by governments uh, we can limit and avoid the worst possible impacts of climate change and possibly uh, even see some of those effects reversed in the future. Katrina, thank you. Well, we now know the costs of doing nothing, but the question remains, who's prepared to pay up to end the fossil fuel era? Well, the Committee on Climate Change estimates that reaching net zero emissions by 2050 could cost the UK around 1 to 2 per cent of GDP. That's roughly equivalent to about £50 billion each year by 2050. Well, in a moment, I'll speak to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. First, though, let's bring in our political correspondent, Rob Powell. And Rob, does this report put extra pressure on the government here to meet its climate change commitments? And is it clear how that will be paid for? Yes, it does put extra pressure on. And no, it isn't clear at all. The UK wants to see to be seen to be leading by example in the run-up to COP26. So there will be extra pressure on them to spell out exactly how they are going to meet that net zero target. We are expecting uh, a number of strategy papers in the coming weeks, in early September, one of which will be spelling out the heat and building strategy. There's already concern among MPs, though, uh, about the impact of potential higher energy bills and expensive green technology like heat pumps and how lower income households are going to pay for that. There's also a tussle in government about how you can plug the gap left by a move to electric vehicles and the lack of fuel duty. So a lot for the government to get right, but they are clear uh, that the cost of the economy would be more if they did nothing. And Dominic, some will say that the priority now is for the world's biggest emitters to take action now. So what has the response of the international community been? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sharpening the sense of urgency that's already there, not least because of these fires and floods and devastation we've seen uh, this year. That there's a sense of trying to make up for lost time because of the pandemic, but also the denialism of the, uh, the Trump era. And if you talk to people involved in the diplomatic process, they say there is a lot going on. But there's also a realisation that the science is shifting. It's becoming more pessimistic, as this report bears out, uh, and uh, the sense that extreme weather is happening even earlier, and that is potentially catastrophic. So it, it, all eyes will be on COP26 in Glasgow, and there's this consensus, as you say, that the big emitters have got to reduce their emissions, but also come up with cash to help those poorer countries do the same and also deal with the effects of climate change in the third world. And there's also this challenge. It's got to be a credible effort to, in Glasgow in just three months' time because people have got to remain hopeful. If they give up hope, then the game is over. I think the good news from this report, as Katerina was saying, was that there is time to save the planet, but it's running out and a lot more needs to be done. Rob Powell, Dominic Wackhorn, thanks both very much indeed. Meanwhile, the effects of the warming planet continue to be felt today. In Greece, the extreme heat wave and resulting fires have forced thousands to flee their homes, not knowing what will be left when they return. Help has come in the form of an international band of firefighters and Sky News has spoken to some who are certain that climate change is to blame. Sally Lockwood reports from outside Athens. Just 16 miles north of Athens, the fire has subsided. 
but the bone dry land is smouldering and threatens to flare up again. Do you want a hand? As we check out the damage, a tree reignites, just metres from someone's home. <laughs> Environmental scientist Konstantinos Liarikos calls it in, but resources are stretched to their limits. And when it comes to climate change, patience is wearing thin. We are very worried about what we are seeing, as we are every summer, actually. We're getting fires as part of our ecosystem in the Mediterranean and in Greece, but year after year they're getting all the worse because of climate change. It aggravates temperatures, the summer's getting drier, and the governments and the services are getting less and less competent to manage the phenomenon. More than 20 countries have now sent support to join the firefighting effort in Greece. This team from France arrived on Thursday but have no idea if they'll be here for weeks, even months. Oui, aujourd'hui, la protection civile et les feux sont européens. Le changement climatique concerne tout le monde et je pense que tous les pays peuvent contribuer à venir ici en Grèce ou dans d'autres pays méditerranéens en particulier. Et ça c'est inquiétant pour vous. Oui, c'est inquiétant, mais on est là pour se préparer et pour être performant pour aider les autres. Firefighters now find themselves on the front line in the battle against extreme weather. And with 45 degree heat forecast here once again, there's a very real fear fires will return in the coming days and years. Sally Lockwood, Sky News, Athens. Now we're continuing to look at the IPCC's long-awaited report into climate change. And you can see from this diagram, Included in the report, global warming is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe with human influences contributing to many changes in weather and climate extremes. Well, let's talk to one of the lead authors of the report now, Dr Yuri Rogel, who's Director of Research at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London. Welcome to you. So a stark warning in this report, the UN Secretary General has called it code red for humanity. But is there a chance that catastrophe can be avoided? Well, the report is very clear. Uh, we have warmed our planet today already by 1.1 degrees, and that is, uh, we are responsible for that. But we also have important choices to make today, uh, depending on how fast we reduce our emissions over the next decade. Uh, we might still be able to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, which is one of the key limits of the UN Paris Agreement. Um, but if we don't do so, then we will be cruising through those limits uh, over the next decades and end up with much higher warming in the next half of the century. So some hope if we do manage to limit the rises to 1.5 degrees. So how do we do that? What are the solutions? Well, the report uh, really spells out the clear geophysical requirements that are needed to limit warming to 1.5. First of all, to stop warming at any level, uh, we need to stop adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, in technical terms, we need to bring global emissions down to net zero. For each ton that we put in the atmosphere, we have to also remove somewhere else a same ton of, of CO2. Um, then in order to limit warming to 1.5, the amount of CO2 that we emit until we get to net zero is very limited because we have a carbon budget. And uh, in, in the most simplest of terms, that means that uh, if we start on a straight line from today, uh, we would need to be at net zero uh, around mid-century. But what difference do you think this report could have on galvanising change? After all, politicians have heard stark warnings many times in the past. They absolutely have. And I think this report uh, provides a couple of new insights. The first is that... Uh, the IPCC, for the first time ever, uses the word unequivocally to attribute the climate change that we see around us and the impacts, the rising sea level, the, the increases in extremes to our human activities. And that is, of course, because we are living on a changed planet today. People uh, around the globe are experiencing impacts that they have never seen in their lifetimes, that we have never seen before in recorded uh, history. And I think, uh, unfortunately, that experience of what a world with climate change really means uh, seems to me uh, a key 
uh, aspect of galvanizing actions towards uh, stopping this increasing global warming. Dr. Yuri Rogel, thanks very much indeed. In today's other climate news, St Mark's Square in Venice has flooded due to unusual and out-of-season high water levels. The flooding has been attributed to a combination of factors exacerbated by climate change. These include rising sea levels and unusually high tides that typically only occur in autumn and winter months. European Space Imaging has released these satellite images of the Greece wildfires which can be seen from space. The country has been struck by a number of wildfires in recent days and one blaze in Athens has subsided. And the government has announced it will provide funding to double the size of a wind turbine plant in Hull to support the offshore wind industry. The £186 million investment at the Siemens Gamma factory will create 200 new jobs and power 1.3 million homes. In total, the government are investing £266 million into offshore wind turbines across the Humber regions. Now, one of the greenhouse gases which is often overlooked is methane. According to today's IPCC report, it's already warmed the planet by around 0.3 degrees. Reducing our methane emissions from agriculture and gas production could be one of the quickest ways to halt the temperature rise. So what is it? Well, here's an explainer. Well, here to explain more is Dr Anna Jones, no relation, Interim Director of Science at the British Antarctic Survey. Welcome to you. Uh, so reducing methane could have a big impact on global warming. So how do we do it? Which sectors are producing it in the first place? So about half of the emissions of methane into the atmosphere come from anthropogenic man-made sources. Um, quite large quantities from the fossil fuel sector, um, about equal amounts from the agricultural sector. Um, and 20% and, uh, or so from waste. So you have to tackle across those different sectors um, and then you can aim to achieve the kind of reductions which would be very, very good to do. And how do you go about that? Are there technologies already available to try to reduce the methane emissions in those industries? Are the solutions out there? Well, for some of them, the answer is yes. Um, if you look at um, oil and gas infrastructure, for example, um, you can some methane is lost to the atmosphere during production process, during extraction, during transmission. Um, that methane is just lost. It doesn't do anybody any good and it warms the atmosphere. So actually, if you can reduce the amount which you're losing through leaks and poor production processes, then you have an automatic win. It would save... Um, it's obviously good for the planet, which means it's good for all of us, but it's also good for industry because it um, it actually would increase profit margins in the sense that it's um, it's cost neutral. They would be saving money by not losing the methane to the atmosphere. And is there enough focus on reducing methane emissions, given what difference it could make? That's a really good question, quite an interesting one. In the scientific community, there has been quite a focus on methane over... Um, the last, you know, last several years, but um, the conversations that are had within the media and um, you know, within, within decision makers, policy makers, have tended not to consider methane so much. And the focus is on carbon dioxide and reducing concentrations of carbon dioxide is absolutely fundamental to tackling climate change. We have to get concentrations of carbon dioxide under control. But the beauty of methane is it, it gives you a window Methane um, 
it, it's a short lived gas. So if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's there for several hundreds of years. If you put methane into the atmosphere, it actually only has what's called a lifetime of 10 years. So you, you can reduce concentrations of methane in the atmosphere relatively quickly. So what's good about methane, there are quite a lot of things that are good about methane, but one of them is that it buys you time. You can, you can by reducing your methane emissions, which is relatively straightforward to do for some sectors and some sources, you gain some additional sorry, some additional time to tackle your carbon dioxide emissions. Dr Anna Jones, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's everything from us for today. Coming up on tomorrow's show, how people living on Rathlin Island plan to reduce emissions and become carbon neutral. You can catch that at the same time here on Sky News. See you then.